Um, so I was just reading your console right now. Uh, we have leash reactivity. I think you put human aggression. Yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead and fill me in. Okay, so she's a year old. Um, and I think she's always been just a little bit skittish. She's uh -huh. good with other dogs. She goes okay. to the Pups Pet Club yep. and does daycare there. She's fine with the workers there. Okay. It's usually when people come into our house, ah. and a lot of times it's little kids because we have a three-year-old daughter. So I don't mm. know if it deals with her or what, but she doesn't like anybody like near her or want to let them pet her. And mm -hmm. even if they're like not paying attention, she'll like go up and I don't know, kind of snap at them. Okay. She bit my sister once, okay. um, but she, my sister is being really aggressive with her. Okay. Otherwise, she hasn't bit anybody. It's more, I think, fear. Based. When she bit your sister, was there punctures? No, it was just like, yeah. Okay. Um, and what was your sister doing? Because I know you said she was being like... Yeah, I think she was just um, getting up to her, trying to pet her and make her like... Okay. And your sister's an adult, I assume? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was this when she came in, like entering the home, or was this like just uh, maybe like ten to fifteen minutes after she was there? Okay, and then what was her behavior after she arrived? Um, just like leery of her, I would ah, say. sure. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, when people come over, what's her behavior like? She barks a lot at them. Okay. And, um, yeah, just kind of wants to. It seems like she wants to go up to attack them okay but i don't let her obviously so a lot of times i'm just putting her away in a different room sure getting her away from the situation does she keep barking in the other room or does uh, she eventually maybe, calm down maybe for about a minute or two and then she calms down okay and then uh like if the person makes a loud noise or anything will she start barking again or is she calm for the rest of the time um, she's pretty calm yeah but if she hears us go in and out of that room then she'll start bark. barking yeah i got gotcha. you okay what about outside, like in this kind of environment? How is she with people? She seems fine. Um, no, nope. I don't let anybody come up to pet her or do anything. But she, like for walking, she, she may like put her nose up to try to smell somebody walking by. Okay. But um, she doesn't do anything. Okay, like so that. she's not like leash reactive. Right. Okay. And then good with dogs on and off leash or? Uh, yeah. Okay. And you've had her since she was two months? Yep. When, does the, when did these behaviors start? Okay. When we first got her, I was out walking her as a puppy, and two dogs started barking, and it scared her. Mm -hmm. And I had one of those leashes where it like retracts. Yes. And it got away from me and hit her in the butt, and she just like ran off. Okay. So it spooked her a little bit. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, but that was with dogs, you said. Yeah. Okay. So then we did that pups pet club, and they had pet puppy training. Like, yeah. Basic stuff yeah. like food and all that. Okay. Have you, have you done any training with this behavior stuff? No. Okay, so just the basic puppy stuff. Yep. I gotcha. And then uh, where'd you get the prong from? Um, Was that like just you, you decided to like, do it? Yeah, or? I did it because she pulls really hard on the leash. Okay. Have you had other dogs before? Yes. And you use prong collars for them? Okay. Um, let me think. So as far as you know, like the terror, because uh, the behavior with people coming into the home to me sounds like territorial behavior. She's been doing that ever since she was a puppy? I think so. Okay. We, I feel like when she was a puppy, we didn't have a lot of people over, so... I see. I don't remember her being that way. Okay. On average, just like, um, do you not have a lot of people come over just in general? Or is it just kind of like... I guess not. Yeah. Okay. Like my in-laws come over and we just put her away because my father-in-law speaks another language. Okay. So it's hard to tell them to be like, leave her alone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, is there anybody that comes over that she does not have a problem with? My dad. Okay. And this is the one that speaks a different language? No, that's my husband's dad. I see. Okay. My dad, the uh, -law. Okay. he lives in Ohio, and so whenever he's around, she has no problem with him. Okay. And uh, when does she meet him? Um, same time she met all the other people, like my sister and siblings. Okay. And your sister, she's the one that she bit? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so she met your sister way back when yeah okay uh how often has she met your sister probably five times okay so not a whole lot no. and your dad probably about the same but he's stayed with us ah for like a period of time yeah. i see 
Okay. When or, she was younger? Or, yeah, and then when we go visit them, we stay with them. I see. My sister's not there. Okay. Um, anything else? Um, I don't think so. She's, uh, she's a good-looking dog. Yeah, she's pretty. And she's with Senji and what? Terrier mix? Uh, yeah, rat terrier, rat terrier. And fox terrier. We have a Basenji that comes to our daycare. He's crazy. Yeah, yeah. that's what I hear. It's like the Basenji maybe. Of yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> the, her behavior and this Basenji's behavior is very different. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really categorize that as really the Basenji's behavior. Okay. Um. So the reason why, like, for all these questions, is, is I'm trying to decipher, like, where's this behavior coming from? Yeah. Okay. Now, in my opinion, um, I don't think she's aggressive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because um, when you're when she bit your sister, or, or it sounds like she uh, gave a correctional nip, mm-hmm. okay? Because if she wanted to, she could have just got her good, yeah. okay? But it, it, that sounds like that did not happen. And she's the only person that she's nipped. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen her seen her try to nip? Yeah. Okay. And what what what's an instance where uh, she's tried? Well, my uh, brother was visiting last weekend. Okay. With his two kids, one's eight and one's thirteen. Okay. And the eight-year-old wants to get up to go to the bathroom, and she, like, lunged at him. Ah, okay. Um, was she on the leash or off? She was off. Off? And then, uh, so she just tried, but she didn't? Right. So I have this, um, like, protection sensitive. Yeah. this on her. Yep, yep. So, yeah, when she does it, it's like she's wearing this. So I see, so you're not... Him. I don't know if she would do anything more harmful than whatever. But yes. I just don't want anybody to get hurt. Okay. And you said she's good with dogs, right? She's yeah. Off this way. Um, so, and does she have any um, uh, hesitation or apprehension with the, with your muzzle, or she wears no. it no problem? Yeah, she wears it no problem. Excellent. Okay. Good. So, because like, that makes uh, life a lot easier, mm-hmm. uh, it's a it's a safety measure. Okay. So, um, when she went after the eight year old. Was there even any contact with the muzzle, or she just like attempted but didn't do anything? I think she just attempted. Okay, I was, like, so like kind of stopped herself. Yeah. Did it, did anybody go like clap or shout or anything to stop her? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then she did, did. it look like she responded to that, or did it look like she just stopped herself? It looked like she responded to it, so then she went to her a little bit. I see. Down and was like... <laughs> okay. Okay. So for me, like, so the reason why I asked that stuff is the fact that she responded to, to, to someone shouting. Right, and like it be, that being a deterrent again for me leads me more along the lines of like she's not aggressive. Um, it sounds one like territorial behavior, okay. Two, it's not uncommon for dogs not to like kids. Uh, reason being is kids tend to be erratic, okay. So, like, um, uh, you know, dogs that de- develop very quickly, you know, by the time they're two months. We adopt, we rescue, we rescue them, or adopt them out, or whatever. And they're like running around, they're playing, they're barking at things, right? Mm-hmm. They're they're already moving around. Whereas for the human, up until like what six months, we don't start crawling, and then like maybe a few months later, we start to like attempt to walk, and then when we walk, it's kind of we're trying to gain balance. It's very slow. So a lot of times, dogs they see that as unnatural because they develop so quickly. Okay, so it's not uncommon for them to show this kind of apprehension or nervousness, or even like um, I don't like what's going on here, yeah. okay? Because like, they get used to, oh, you're immobile. You're just in that um, car seat thing or whatever, right? You don't, you don't move and all of a sudden it's like, now you're moving? I don't, I don't know how I feel about this, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's actually pretty common. Okay. Um, I am picking up, uh, although she seems fairly stable here, nervous energy. Yeah. Uh, so nervous energy is what would trigger, uh, like when you said the eight-year-old got up and moved, mm-hmm. right? Nervous energy tends not to like loud noises, big noises, boisterous energy, loud energy, kid type energy, and or sudden movements, okay? <coughs> so, let's say a guest comes over. She barks at them initially. And then you keep her in the room, maybe on the leash. She calms down. You guys are talking. And then the person stands up. I would expect that she would start barking, mm-hmm. okay? Because she just got comfortable. Everything's calm. And then 10 minutes later, the person stands up and that causes the barking. That would be a nervous dog, okay? So, um, the territorial behavior stuff is normal. It's instinctual. It's just we don't 
if we don't handle it correctly, it can escalate. Okay. Going back to when she like nipped or bit your sister, um, it was 10 to 15 minutes after she had come into the home. You had mentioned she was still leery. And then your sister put on what I would call social pressure. Hey, right, like me. And then she's like, uh, I'm already still kind of leery of you. I need you to respect my space. Here's a correctional nip, okay? Um, which is natural because dogs correct each other through nipping and biting. But when we apply that to a human, it's usually seen bad. Yeah. Right? Oh, dogs should not bite people. And that's not really a concept that they understand because dogs bite anything and everything that they feel they would need to bite. Okay? okay. So like children to dogs are like little puppies. Okay. So if a puppy came up to her and let's say she got annoyed with the puppy, she would nip the puppy. So I'm like, you're not going to do that to me. Yeah. Right. Uh, again, people tend to misread that. They're like, oh, like the puppy was just trying to be friendly and like you bit the puppy, like you're mean or you're aggressive. I go, no, it's not. It's a correction. It's saying like, hey, puppy, you need to have boundaries. So dogs will also apply that to children. Okay. But then also, again, because it's a human, we, we tend to see it as bad. So that's why, you know, when I ask all these questions, I'm, I'm trying to decipher, is this really aggression? Or is this a dog that's really just correcting people, putting things in check? Um, uh, with the whole territorial behavior stuff, it's someone entering the home. Um, instinct is to protect, right? So all that is, is technically fine. But if we don't know how to control it and or stop it, it can become problematic. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So, because right now, with watching her behavior, like, yeah, she, like, went over there to, like, say hi to the dog and stuff. She's a bit of an alert state. Yeah. But for the most part, she's standing, like, right next to you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, I don't really pick up a ton of behavioral stuff. I think yeah. that's just a dog that's kind of doing things that's, that we're not reading correctly or not understanding how to control, and that's where the problems are going to happen, okay? Uh, questions on any of that stuff? Great dog. I don't want to say a perfect angel, but yeah, she's really good behavior-wise. Yeah, okay, because that's her, that's her familiarity. That's her every day, yeah. right? And then when you start to add in external stimuli, that's where things start to happen. But in my experience, if this was really like a problem, like it would be like, Jesse, this dog like nailed five people. Like this is like, yeah. this is a thing, okay? So human aggression is like, the dog will resort to aggressive behaviors towards a person uh, very easily, consistently, and to like a degree of like, okay, there's punctures and like each time, you know? So like, for example, this here is a dog bite. This is 10 stitches. Uh, this is not an aggressive dog. This is a dog that I was trying to load into a kennel and uh, he panicked and freaked out and he, needed, he felt he needed to defend himself. So instead, he, well, to defend himself, he, he looked up, he was a great Dane. So there's no way for me to avoid it. Uh, he just bit my hand, yeah. okay? Uh, so when I called the owners, I told them your dog's not aggressive. He just freaked out, he, he panicked. He had never been put in a kennel before, so all this stuff makes sense. Um, and uh, so, because it was for a boarding train, so they took him home so I could heal up. I trained him later on. It's been four years since, and we've never had an issue, and there's never been an issue like that again, okay? It's all contextual, does that make sense? Yeah. So even though that this was a severe, like it was a bite bite, um, I have to calculate everything that was surrounding the situation and I go, the dog's not aggressive, he just freaked out, felt he needed to protect his life and unfortunately for me, my hand was there and that's what took the blunt of the hit, okay? So that's how I can determine because then it's like, okay, even if there was multiple attempts, then I have to go by uh, how bad were the bites. So if all the bites are like little nips or like attempts, then I go, okay, the dog is attempting but they don't have the confidence to follow through. Okay, so these are all things that I evaluate, okay? So I don't feel like you have an aggressive dog. I think you have a dog that's correcting people or, or kids and everything. But it's not good because uh, if someone did respond the wrong way, for example, I had a, a client that I had worked with. Their kid and the dog were playing. There had never been an issue before. The dog, uh, I think, like nipped or did something to the kid. Uh, the child screamed because got, she got spooked, took off and then the dog chased and then bit, okay? So the owner, of course, they were like, they were freaking out. And I was like, well, what it sounds like is they were playing. Uh, the dog did something, pushed the boundary. Uh, your child got spooked, yeah. screamed and took off. I'm like, the scream sounds like a dead animal or a dying animal, yeah. turns on prey drive and then runs immediately afterwards and definitely turns on prey drive and then your dog went to pursue, 
okay? I was like, if this was really like a problem, it would have happened multiple times, you know, like it would have been like three instances or whatever. Yeah. This was like a one-off thing in, in years, okay? Mm -hmm. So then I just said like, make sure, you know, when they're playing, like I would either put a boundary and like all this stuff, but to me, it just sounds like all the bad thing, all the wrong things happening at the right time, which escalated, okay? So in your case, if she were to attempt to like nip at a child and then they would, ah, right? Yeah. I would anticipate then it would pull out more possibly. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, question on any of that? No. Uh, before reaching out and booking this, did you do any research on how we train the methods that we use and everything? Um, a little bit. I watched a few videos. Okay. And, uh, I will fill you in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I train primarily with remote collar, which is e-collar. Okay. okay? Yeah. So we do prong and e-collar. I don't do prong as much anymore because it takes more technical skill. Okay. Uh, and people tend, especially if they have reactive dogs, they tend to lock up a lot. And since using a prong collar is leash based, what happens is they just keep getting stuck like this. Oh, okay? okay, so it, it's uh, it's old habits coming through that work against the owner. Okay. okay, so I train primarily with remote collar. Any dog that does training with me that's over six months is going to be on the e collar. Okay. okay, the only time I use a prong collar is like uh, I had a, a, a client who was like this tall, maybe 100 pounds, with a 140 pound Great Dane. Okay, who was leash reactive. And she lived in Bucktown, so it was like dogs all over the place. So she needed both remote and prong collar to give her the most leverage and control. Because okay. she could turn the corner and there would be a dog. So the prong collar was there for the physical immediate control, while the e-collar was what was actually stopping the dog from being reactive, okay? But 98% of the time, it's just strictly remote collar, okay? okay. Uh, so the reason why I do remote is because right off the bat, you get off-leash control, okay? It's the only tool, in my opinion, that gives you off-leash control because on or off-leash, I have means of communication with the dog, okay? Prong collar is a great tool. I love them. It's just that they take more technical skill on behalf of the owner, okay? Uh, also, if I remove that leash from the prong collar, we no longer have contact with the dog, okay? Same thing with like food, uh, uh, gentle leaders, or any other training tool. Every other tool requires you to have like some kind of physical connection to the dog through the leash. With remote collar, we do not, okay? okay? Also with remote collar, it allows us to correct things instantaneously. So like, let's say you're in the yard, one of the kids is running around, for whatever reason, she thinks she needs to go and correct them. You would not need a leash to be on her in order to stop that behavior, okay? Um, it also allows us to correct behaviors without confrontation, okay? Because the dog does not know where it's coming from, okay? okay? So like, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a fear-based dog, okay? A dog that is scared of people, for whatever reason, yeah, that's a little. Now that I would say is Basenji. Yeah. <laughs> um, the way she was standing there. Um, oh, so if I have a fear-based dog, right, and they're scared of me, if I have a prong collar on them, if I yank the dog, the dog goes, "That's why I'm scared of you," and you physically hurt me because I did the pull. If the owner corrects the dog, the dog goes, "Why are you correcting me? Can't you see that I'm scared of this person?" Okay. With remote collar the dog does not know where it's coming from. Everybody is a neutral, okay? okay? So if the dogs... So if they're going after somebody and they get... Um, corrected. Corrected, they don't associate with that person? Nor the, hum nor, nor okay. the owner. It's, it's, it's a, a, like an act of God, okay? okay? Yeah. So we use that to our advantage to help press um, the dog's fear. So typically with a fear-based dog, the, the, the worst thing that could ever happen to them is being touched. Okay, so I have a special suit that I wear, okay. it's 60 pounds, that allows me to touch the dog. The dog can bite me, they can freak out. We're correcting on the collar, gradually going up until we find a number that brings them back down to calmness, and then I keep petting them. And the dog goes, I try to attack you, you weren't scared of me, you didn't back away. While I was attacking you, this thing started to turn on, I don't know why, but when it turned, when I stopped attacking you, the thing went away, okay? And we keep repeating that. Eventually, the dog learns, if I bite you, this thing turns on. If I don't bite you, it doesn't turn on, right? Yeah. But then when you pet me, nothing bad happens. So it allows us to work the dog psychologically for them to learn, like, oh, you're not a threat to me. But if I act out, one, you're not phased, but then two, this thing turns on, right? So it helps them learn how to take what we call social pressure, being pet. That's uh, what your, your sister did, essentially. Yeah. Um, and learn that nothing bad's gonna happen and they don't need to be scared, okay? okay. Because it's a neutral, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Sure. So, uh, in your particular case, uh, 
it's a little bit trickier because I don't like think that she's scared or anything. I think she, like you noted, she was still leery. She was still trying to just get to know your sister, and your sister put too much social pressure on her, and she goes, you know what? I need to back you off, and this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, so um, when it comes to socializing her to open up to more family members, like your sister and stuff, uh, which is uh, realistic, there's exercises that we can do. Okay. Okay. Now there's still gonna be boundaries. So like, I wouldn't have people put their face in her face, yeah. you know, stuff like that, which people tend to do. Mm -hmm. um, if she is a nervous dog, like I think, nervous dogs, like I said earlier, don't like big, loud energy. So if your sister happens to be like a big, boisterous type energy, bubbly type energy, less likely that she would warm up to your sister because of her personality type. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, let's say, because I've had clients who have a nervous dog and they themselves have a bubbly personality. I'll tell them the difference is you're with your dog 24 seven, right? I'm assuming yeah. your sister is not there 24 seven, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the big reason is the dog goes, okay, yeah, you're big personality type, but you know, you, you feed me, you walk me, you give me affection, right? You do all these things with me, plus I'm with you 24 seven. So I accept that you're a big loud personality type, but everybody else, I'm not gonna do so, okay? So uh, questions on any of that stuff. So the first thing that we teach um, to start priming for like the behavioral stuff is heel, which is leash walking. Um, the reason why we do this is most people walk their dogs in the city of Chicago three times a day, seven days a week. Yeah. So it's three times a day, seven days a week, you get to practice this exercise, okay? So e-collar is unnatural to dogs. Uh, are you familiar with the technology is? Uh, yes and no. Okay. So people describe it as like a shock because they hear the word electric collar. Uh, it's not a shock, it's not electrocution. Okay. okay? Uh, are you familiar with TENS units? Yes. The, the muscle stimulator. Yeah. That's an e-collar. Okay. Okay. So it's electric but not electricity is how okay. I like to describe it to people. So like there's not like a current running through your dog's body. Okay. It's centralized to where the two, there's two probes that, we, that go against the neck that make contact with uh, and it, the, the muscles and it stimulates the muscles, okay? Okay. Uh, I actually put a video up on my YouTube channel where it's like e-collar versus TENS unit and okay. you see me comparing them side by side and they do the exact same thing oh, okay. but to different degrees, okay? So a TENS unit is meant to stimulate a muscle continuously, okay? So they use it to break up scar tissue, they use it to ease back pain or muscle pain. Yep. Uh, I have clients that are like marathon runners and now they even attach it to like a needle and yeah. they poke the needle through the muscle to make contact with the muscle. Uh, so with your leash, pull up. Okay. Just up, yep, and then now relax. So when she jumps on you, instead of uh, petting or trying to push her off, you're just gonna pull straight up, okay? okay? Um, they literally put a needle through to make contact with the muscle that they want to stimulate, and then the machine turns on and it starts to twitch the muscle, okay? okay. Uh, so it's, it's, it's um, but since it's meant to ease muscle tension and stuff, it's continuous, whereas for, for dog training, it's momentary. Okay, okay? so it's like a pre-time sensation. There is a continuous function, but we very, very rarely ever, ever use it, okay? Mm -hmm. More often than not, 99% of the time, we're using what we call the stim or the nick function, where once you press it, there's a quick stimulation of the muscle and then it stops, okay? So, uh, so e-collar is simply a miniaturized tens unit. Um, so since it is unnatural for a dog to have their muscle stimulated, we always start with the healing exercise because it allows us to layer in the e-collar in a non-confrontational manner. Okay. okay. So you would show up, you would have your dog, you'd have the collar that I would suggest that you pick up, and I coach you through everything. I don't need to touch your dog. Okay. okay? So I help you figure out real time uh, what your dog's sensitivity level is, what their number is going to be on the e-collar, and then I teach you how to start teaching your dog how to heal. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why the heal is important is it allows us to teach the dog how to turn on the collar and how to turn off the collar. Okay. okay so they start to understand is I like to uh, call a, a bite on the button. Okay. So dogs communicate through physicality. Uh, she gave your sister a very good example, right? If you get yes. too much in my space, I'm gonna do this to let you know I don't like that, right? Um, so with the remote collar, I'm essentially trying to layer it in so the dog kind of learns to understand it's similar to a bite. So the dog goes, okay, this thing is actually communicating with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we start to build on that. Okay. So the first class you show up, I work you through everything. It's all real time. If your dog has any issues, I help you work through it. Okay. And then I give you your homework. You go off and you practice for a week, okay? You come back for your second class. I'll ask you a few questions, you know, ask you how she's doing. 
get your opinion on things. We do a quick review, and then we work on the second half of heel. Okay, so heel is a two-part exercise. Okay. By the third class, we could technically start jumping into behavioral stuff. Okay, so now the dog is primed. The dog has a good understanding of what the collar is, how it turns on, and how it turns off. So if we start to apply this, for example, when people come over and she's barking, when we start to apply it there, she has a concept and she goes, okay, that thing is back yeah. in a different context. But I understand that if I do something or change something, this thing that I don't like will go away. And then I help coach through all that stuff as well. Okay. okay. So then, um, so we have territorial behavior, which is people coming into the home. Okay. Now do bear in mind, if you have people come over once in a while, um, your progress is going to be very slow. Okay, now if you like if you had people come over four to five okay. times, so yeah, bring her in and then you can pull up on your leash. And then so with your right hand pull up and then with your left hand push down on her hindquarters. Oh. Like that. Okay. Good. Um your progress should be very slow. Okay? okay. Now if you had people coming over twenty times a week or whatever, up on your leash, pull up on your leash, down on her butt, you would make much quicker progress. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now keep in mind we're not Stopping territorial behavior, okay? Up on your leash, yep. down on her butt. Yep. We're not stopping it. We're not eliminating it. What we're doing, up on your leash, yep, down on the butt. Good. Uh, what we're doing is we're controlling it. Yep, up on your leash. Yep. There we go. And then down on the butt. Very good. Um, we're controlling it. I'm giving you the ability to turn it off, okay? Mm-hmm. From there, we can start worrying about socialization. Okay, if that's your concern. Now, when it comes to socialization, I only care about, up on your leash, about the people that she would meet on a regular basis. Your okay. sister, the in-laws, you know, yeah. up. There you go. Um, if it's like the random person that tags along as a friend or whatever, I could care less. Because okay. she's not going to meet them again in the future. Okay? Yeah. But anybody she would meet on a regular basis, I would care about. That is realistic because she would see them repeatedly. Okay. okay? So like... Um, your dad, correct? Mm-hmm. Because even though she's only seen him, I think you said five times, but he had, she's seen him for an extended period of time. He, yeah. I think you mentioned he stayed with you and you stayed with them. That makes sense to me why she's warmed up to him. But if everybody else is momentary, a few hours here, a day here and there, it makes sense that she would yeah. not be as trusting of them, okay? okay. So, uh, so first two classes are on heel. Third class is uh, we work on how do we turn off territorial behavior. The next class can be how do we start socializing her with people that come into the home? And how do we start building trust, okay? Uh, we would use food here to tie in um, a positive. So now you have both. You have, if you act out, I can correct you to tell you you don't do that. But now I have food to let you know like, yes, this person means good things, okay? We can technically apply that theory to children as well, okay? okay. Now, uh, we can do all these exercises, but unfortunately, we cannot make your dog like a person or a child. That is her personal decision, right? We have, up on your leash, we have things that we can do, uh, but if ultimately she's like, hey, I just don't like kids, unfortunately, we can't force that to happen, yeah. okay? Uh, so it's like with people, like if you dislike someone, something, no one can make you like that something, right? You have to decide yourself one day, like, you know what? I actually do like it. Yep, you're doing a good job. Pretty good. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And plus with kids, because they are erratic and that loud energy type stuff, that's also a potential reason of why she would not warm up to them. Okay? Yeah. But it's all the same process. We have a very controlled uh, exercise that we do, and it's just rinse and repeat. And then ideally in time, she would start to open up to them and go like, you know what, you're not too bad. Okay? okay. The fact that she already is used to wearing a muzzle and stuff already puts you ahead. Because that's usually the big factor that holds people back is their dog is not muzzle conditioned. And then in order to socialize, I would use a muzzle to help eliminate or reduce liability. Mm-hmm. Also to help you feel better because when you start to be, when you're gonna be in close proximity with kids and stuff, pushing this, this threshold essentially, <clears throat> we tend to get worried. Yeah. What happens is you trade. I feel like I'm nervous, I don't know if that. Projects, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, it can in the sense that it changes your behavior a bit. But as long as you're pushing through it and like, you know, just doing the best you can, it's not the biggest factor. Okay. But if you're like getting nervous and you're like this and you're like, yeah. the dog's gonna see that and then something's gonna happen, okay? But the muzzle allows you to push these things and, and be much more relaxed about it. It also allows the person that's helping you 
also be relaxed because like okay your dog's wearing the muzzle the uh, the risk of uh, being bitten or whatever is is greatly reduced okay does that make sense for sure so in terms of like what you're trying to achieve with with cleo yep um i'm assuming it's the behavior stuff yep right with the children and like the guests coming over um obedience wise what are you looking for her to be able to do um she jumps up a lot as you saw uh -huh. and she'll jump up on the counters and stuff like that so we want counter cats. surfing okay yeah um not all the way up but just like puts her hands up there uh, my daughter who's three has like her toys and then this dog has her toys she's always like running in my daughter's room and getting her toys mm. half the time when we say drop it she'll drop it half the time she won't okay I've been, now that she's a year old, taking her running with me. Okay. She's been doing okay. Just trying to get some energy out of her. Yeah. Um, just, I think the heels will help with that. Yes. Uh, when you run, does she pull or does she like stay at your side? What yeah, does she do? Yeah, well, if we're at a good pace, she'll stay by my side, but every now and then she'll see like a bird or a rabbit. Okay. She'll pray drive. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So that's not a problem. Uh, anything else? Yeah, just pulling on the leash. What about recall? She's pretty good with recall. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about with like birds and squirrels and stuff? Not as much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we'd want to tighten that up. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so the reason why I asked is that's what kind of determines how long I would suggest for your program. Okay. Uh, obedience uh, is always the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know what I can get done in an amount of time pending the owner is doing their homework. Okay. okay? Because obedience is just skill set, right? Walk at my side, come when I call you, put your butt down, stuff like that. It's all yeah. skills. Um, when it comes to behavior, that's what always carries the greatest variables, okay? Because it's how often were you able to practice? Mm -hmm. um, uh, did she even try doing anything, you know, that you corrected? Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you only have people come over like once every couple of weeks or whatever, like it's going to be a very slow process. Yeah. And again, we're not trying to eliminate the territorial behavior. We're just trying to control it. Okay. okay. The territorial behavior, in my opinion, is technically healthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's her protecting the home. Yep. The problem is she doesn't understand like this is someone that I invited yeah. over. Spread this is phone. the plumber. Exactly. <laughs> She's just like, this is our house and stay out. Right. Yep. So the exercise that we cover, there really is no kind of end result of she's going to stop the behavior. But the faster she understands the concept is determined on how often are you able to practice it, okay? okay? Once, you under, once you have these skills, you just apply them as you need them, okay? okay. So um, I would probably put you at like at the shortest, maybe six classes, more so probably nine, okay? okay? Um, you're not a behavior case in case that's what you were thinking. Okay. The behavior case is like the very expensive like $5,000 program, okay? okay? Um, the reason why I say that is because this is behavior, but this is mild behavior. Okay. The really expensive one is for, um, like the dog is like, you can't even walk into the house because you're going to get bit. Okay. okay. Like you have no life because the dog is just like terrible. Okay. And that program is expensive because it comes with like a quote unquote guarantee slash warranty. Yeah. Is if I, I come in, I address all the issues, we get everything in a good place and I go, thank you for the opportunity. And then if something happens a year or two years later, they would call me up and say, hey, Jesse, this happened. Can yeah. you come in? I come back. I go, okay, this will take three classes. I fix it. They don't pay more money. Okay. okay. Uh, that's why it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, that and plus the risk of harm to me is obviously yeah. much greater. Sure. Uh, otherwise, 99% of the dogs that I train fall underneath the other programs. Okay. okay? So uh, if you did six, I kind of bare bones things, meaning I target the really important stuff, the stuff okay. that I know that it's going to be very beneficial to you. Uh, I don't really teach stuff that you're not going to use or I don't think is going to be important to you. Okay. okay. So two classes on heel, that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that's what sets the dog up for everything. Class three would be in the home, coming over, teaching you how to handle that situation. Class four would be how do we properly introduce her to a guest and or a child using food and e-collar. Okay. okay. Uh, class five, I would probably teach some kind of stationary control, which is like go to your bed and don't move. Yeah. Because, remember, we cannot make her like the guests and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, when you put her away in another room, which I understand, is you're actually increasing the antisocialness yeah. because you're removing her from the social context. Yeah. So she does not learn how to interact, okay? Currently, that's all you have, so you're yeah. perfectly fine. 
But if you continue with that, the behavior is not going to go anywhere. Potentially it gets worse. There's no guarantee that it will, but it definitely won't get better. Okay. So um, let's say you're going to have someone come over. Maybe they had a bad incident with her. And so you're like, okay, well, I know they're not going to want to socialize with her, but you can still keep her in the social context because you can tell her, hey, go to this thing, go to your bed, and you're not going to move for the next four hours. So then she's in the social context with the person that she had the bad interaction with. Then that person also sees like, oh, wow, like you actually can control your dog now. Okay. So then they start to feel more comfortable because it comes up, it becomes a feedback loop. If the person is uncomfortable with your dog, your dog goes, you don't like me. And so I'm not going to like you. Okay. It's a feedback loop. The dog doesn't understand the person is weary of them because of a bad interaction. The dog just thinks like, you don't trust me, so I'm not going to trust you. Okay. So if when the guest starts to be more comfortable, she's like, okay, you're comfortable with me, so I guess I can trust you. It, it works in, in a more positive way, mm-hmm. okay? So now it allows you to keep her in the social context so she's not being isolated, so she can start getting used to like, okay, sometimes mom has people come over yeah. and I'm gonna be here on my bed and these people are gonna leave me alone and everything's fine, yeah. okay? It's just teaching her how to learn, how to, inter- how to coexist, okay? okay? Uh, and then the last class, pending everything's going well, could be like, um, recall potentially yeah uh, or it could be like hey something happened or can we re-review like having people come over or whatever and it's like a, kind of a variable class okay mm-hmm. if you did nine uh it gives us a little bit more of a buffer because then we have like three additional classes to make sure we do cover recall we'll cover okay. stationary control we'll cover all the behavior stuff but at the same time we have time to still work on stuff or to push things okay, okay. behavior is what ta- is, is the greatest variable mm-hmm. okay because it's contingent on how often are you able to have people come over how many times are you able to practice the exercise of people petting her? Like all that stuff plays into part, okay? okay. So um, when I see someone do a longer program, it also shows me like I have time. So the way I lay things out is a little bit different. Okay. If I see someone come in with a shorter program, I go, okay, I only have this much time. So I'm trying to cram as much stuff as possible. So the way I, 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 I uh, plan it is different, okay? okay? So if you did the nine week, Most likely by the sixth class, maybe seventh class, I will have covered all the groundwork, okay? And at that point, I would most likely tell you, take two to four weeks, if not a little bit longer, to just practice, 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 okay? Okay. And then come back for your seventh or eighth class, okay? Okay. Uh, Because you're gonna need time to rinse and repeat. You're gonna need time to screw up, to make mistakes, the dog screws up, you may make mistakes, whatever. So that when you come back for that seventh or eighth class, you're like, hey Jesse, this and this and this happened. And I go, okay, this is how we fix this, this is how we fix that, this is normal, this is what we'll do to fix it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. As opposed to if it's always week by week by week by week, at some point, you know, we're gonna wrap up the program and then something happens after the program because we just streamlined it. Does that make sense? So I've learned throughout my career that when it comes to behavior, time is like your best friend, okay? okay? So once we get the heel down, we get the stationary control down, get the recall stuff down, get all the socialization stuff down, I go, okay, you have enough homework now to just go and practice, and then you come back when you feel like you're ready to push things to the next step. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, questions on any of that? Um, I have a girl that comes and walks her a couple times okay. a week. Is there anything I should nope. be, just have her do whatever she's been doing? Yep. Okay. So dogs learn by association. Okay. So if her relationship with that with the, your dog walker is completely fine, no issues. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Is okay. what we usually say. Okay. Now, uh, if you would like for your dog walker to keep what you're teaching for consistency's sake, that's great. But it won't impact your training. Okay. Okay. So dogs are like kids in the sense that they learn by association. Mm-hmm. So like it's what I call like the grandparent effect. Yeah. It's typically when kids are like uh, are with the grandparents. The grandparents kind of spoil the kids, right? Yeah. Let them get away with stuff. And then you get the kids and like they're like uh, misbehaving a little yeah. bit and you got to get them back in line, right? Are you familiar? Like my child. Yes. It's the same thing for your dog. Okay. So with the walker, she might be like, oh, cool, this is vacation time. But then when you walk her, discipline. Okay. Okay, because she's, she's associating when I'm with mom, I behave this way, yeah. this is not allowed, blah, 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 blah. But I'm with, with the dog walker, I can push boundaries, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not going to impact your training because as long as you're consistent, she's going to learn okay. mom doesn't play games. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Other questions? Um, 
what's the difference between these classes and um, doing like a boot camp where we order? Off? Yeah. Yeah. So in your uh, so whenever it comes to behavior, I always suggest people do it themselves. Yep. Okay. Okay. One, we're most likely not going to see the problem at my facility. Yep. Okay. So it's not that we won't get any work done. Your dog will have all the obedience training, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the behavior stuff, most likely we're not going to be able to do anything because yeah. we can try to recreate but there's no guarantee that we'll actually see it, okay? okay? And it's actually pretty common. Unless the dog is legitimately human aggressive or whatever, a lot of times we don't even see it, okay? okay? So um, with a board and train, uh, you know, you drop the dog off. The pro is we get a lot of obedience done in a yep. short amount of time. Uh, the con is the training is tied to us. Yep. We have to transfer it to you. Okay. Um, and lastly, behaviorally, we cannot guarantee we can recreate everything we can yeah. try but there's no way that we actually can okay? okay um if you do the training the con is it takes longer the pro is you learn a ton more, yeah. okay because okay. it's all hands-on for you yeah. yep it's all hands-on for you um and when you work your dog through things like let's say she um is being stubborn or protesting whatever and not wanting to be compliant and you work her through it that's tied to you. Okay. Okay. If she's with us and we do it, it's tied to us. Okay. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah. So this is very much relationship type based okay. stuff. And also since I've done this for 12 years, I already know how to handle these things. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that you learn how to handle these things, right? Um, there is no such thing as a perfect dog. You're going to have control. You're going to make a lot of progress, but then maybe in a year something happens. But because you did the training yourself, you're like, oh, I know how to fix this. Because yeah. Jesse, we, we learned this in class. I'm going to address it. Okay. And it's not a problem. Okay. So once you understand your dog and where she's coming from and the behaviors, you know, like, so like, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we put it as human aggressive. And then I assess everything. Well, I don't think this is human aggressive. I think this is a dog that's establishing boundaries. It's not good. Uh, and, and then we don't want it to get out of hand. But to me, this seems like this is not aggression. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the more you start to understand and learn about your dog, the better this relationship becomes because you're like, okay, I get where this is coming from. Yeah. Okay. So uh, boot camp gets things done in a short amount of time. Unfortunately, we cannot guarantee we can create these behaviors yeah. uh, in person. Takes longer, but you learn a ton more. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, yeah. So in terms of the probably do the nine horse. Nine. Okay. Uh, in terms of the collar, how much does she weigh? Uh, 35 pounds. 35 pounds? Okay. I would most likely put her on, uh, and Tina will send the information okay, to you. Perfect. The Doctor 2300 or the Black Edition. So the 2300 is meant for a 70 pound dog and under. Okay. Black Edition is meant for a 70 pound dog and over. Okay. okay. They're both perfectly safe to use on your dog despite her size. Mm -hmm. I have an eight pound Chihuahua. I could put it on him. <laughs> it's completely fine. Okay. All it means is you get more from less. Okay. Okay. So the reason why I opt for the higher, so the, there's a size that's meant for a 35 pound dog and under, okay. is she's right at the cusp, uh, gotcha. okay? okay? So let's say she's chasing a squirrel and I've had it happen where we're max power on the collar and they blow right past it, oh, wow. okay? Because it's the strength of the output, the strength okay. of the contraction, okay? So with a larger collar, the 70 pound and under or 70 pound and over, you get more from less, okay? okay? So on a lower power collar, her number could be 60, on a higher powered collar, the number could be 30. Okay. okay. So that's why I always like to lean towards a little so bit higher. one doesn't translate to the next. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it gives you more wiggle room. Um, let's say she was like 20 pounds, then I would be more comfortable going with the smaller collar. Yeah. But because she's right at the threshold, I wouldn't want you to be in a situation where like she's chasing something and you're needing to crank it and it's not enough because she's, she's right at the cusp of the okay. limitation of that collar. Okay. Uh, the black edition, in my opinion, is the best collar. Okay. Um, uh, so it's like, so the 2300 runs around 287-ish with tax. Okay. The black edition is like 337-ish with tax. Okay. okay. So I usually tell people, for 50 bucks more, you, you essentially get the best collar there is. And it's kind of like, I don't even have to worry about the equipment. Okay. okay. But I'll leave that up to your final judgment. She should be fine on either or. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, the collars last a really long time. I had my first collars for almost 10 years. Okay, before they finally crapped out and then had to buy new ones. Okay? okay. The most common thing that happens is uh they have a rechargeable lithium battery like your cell phone, eventually that dies. Okay. 
Uh, they cost like 25 bucks. You can replace it yourself or we can replace it for you at my facility. Uh, and then it works uh, back to normal, oh, okay? okay? If anything ever happens, it does come with a one-year warranty that you can send it in to repair to you at no cost. Okay. After a one-year warranty, you can still send it in for be, to be repaired and then they send you a quote of like, it's gonna cost this much to fix your collar, okay? okay? Uh, as long as you take care of it, like, it's it's rare. It's usually like, people that are very active and they're dropping it and they go to let the dog chew on it type stuff, you know? Uh, otherwise, very rarely is there ever an issue with them, okay? okay? If you purchase the collar through us within the first 30 days, if it happens to be a lemon or there's issues, you just swap the collar. Okay. Uh, we'll give you a new one. I'll handle the collar, the old collar to the, the company myself. If it's after 30 days, you can send it to doctor to be repaired. And then if we have any extra, then I can just provide you with the loaner in okay. the meantime while you're, um, while you're getting it fixed. Okay. okay, so you don't have any gap in your training. How, how long does the dog wear the e-collar? Only when you're actively using it. Okay. So in the beginning, it's not gonna be a whole lot because you're just okay. using it on the walks, okay? okay? But then as you start to teach more skills, stuff in the house, guests coming over, she'll start to wear it more frequently, okay? okay. Which leads me to my next point. The most common question I get is, Jesse, when does the e-collar go away? Okay. In my book, when you need it, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're always using it. It just means that when you need it, it's going to be present. Okay. okay. So, do you drive? Yeah. Do you go on the expressway? Mm -hmm. Do you go the speed limit? No. no. Okay. <laughs> most people don't. Okay. You see a squad car, what happens? Slow oh, down. No. What happens when you pass the squad car? Uh, you're uh, out again, you get back up the speed. Yeah, probably speed up again, right? <laughs> So that's what we call opportunistic behavior. Okay. Okay. All animals do it. It's a part, a part of survival instinct. Okay. So when the dog is wearing the collar, I like to think of it as a cop on the collar. She's going to behave better. Okay. okay? Yeah. And then when you take that collar off, she goes, hey, that cop is gone. I'm going to okay. press the boundaries. Okay. So it's nothing good or bad. It has nothing to do with the training or the method of training. It's, it's, it's not like I'm not a good trainer or anything. It's simply just opportunistic behavior. Mm -hmm. This happens with any method of training that you do, including positive reinforcement. Okay. okay. So. Uh, when guests are going to come over, you have the collar on. Okay. She's being great. You don't use it. It's just there just in case. Yeah. Okay. If she's going to be around kids, you have the collar on. Uh, when you take her on the walk, she'd have the collar on. It's not, you're not always using it. It's just simply there. Okay. okay. And then when you don't need it, you don't have it. Earlier you mentioned when she's with the family, she's a great dog, right? She has a couple things, counter surfing, whatever, but otherwise yeah. she's a great dog. Mm -hmm. It's when we have these external factors that things become uncertain, right? Yep. Then in those moments, you'd have the collar on. Okay. okay. Every case does progress differently. I have had cases in the past where they move past the collar when guests come over. I've had cases where they'll have the collar on for the first 15 minutes, and then once everything's calmed down, they'll take the collar off, the dog is fine. Okay. And in other cases, I get clients that prefer to keep the collar on because they feel they have the most control, yeah. okay, and they'd rather not risk it. Every now and then, I get a case where it's like, I, this dog would have to be muzzled and e-collar when people come over because the risk of harm is so great. Yeah. And it's like if you had a 150-pound Rottweiler. Yeah. I'm like, it's really not worth, you know, the dog can kill a kid, no, right? Yeah. So then I'll tell the owner, always muzzled, always remote collar, when this dog goes around people, always under control, just for liability's sake, yeah. okay? Um, so, but every case is different. I can't predict how it's gonna play out, but I will say whenever she's gonna be off the leash or if you're gonna be walking her, chances are she's gonna have the collar on. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're following the training as, you, as I instruct, the application of it, you actively pressing the button, starts to decline because okay. that tells me the dog is learning the concept okay if yeah. you're using the collar every day it's staying static and or becoming more frequent that tells me something is wrong okay okay uh question on any of that stuff no. uh, bup, bup, bup. last thing would be i can only take you as far as you're willing to go okay okay uh i don't predict that this is going to be difficult i feel like this is going to be for the most part fairly straightforward okay the only thing that i would call out is I do not believe I've worked with a Basenji yet, okay? okay. Um, my experience with Basenjis, and this is just from my daycare, just a yep. couple of them, they are weird dogs, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they don't, they're not like the average dog. A similar breed is Shibas. Mm -hmm. I've okay. trained quite a few Shibas, and Shibas are fucking crazy, okay? <laughs> Especially when you try to train them with remote collar. Okay. They scream, they shriek, they sound like little spider monkeys, and they flip around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really crazy, okay? Because they're one of the most primitive breeds, okay? okay? Now we can still train them, it's just, it's a shit show, yeah. okay, in the beginning because they're so primal, okay? Every other dog, 98% of the time, is not like that. So okay. that's why whenever we train Shibas, I always tell people, be prepared for this, yeah. okay? Because they've typically never seen that side of their dog because their dog has never been put under stress, okay? okay. Um, so I've not worked with the Pasenji mix yet, 
So I would just put that out there just in case. But um, okay. it's really just the, the, um, working them through it to teach them like what they need to do in response. Yeah. And then we get past all that stuff. Okay. But if she were to start freaking out and then you're like, ah, oh, Jesse, I can't do this. You're now working against yourself because mm -hmm. now you've just taught your dog, if you freak out, I will stop doing what you don't want me to do. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do they so, get over the freak out? Yes. Okay. Yes. We just have to push through it. Okay. okay. If it ends up being really bad, then I'll ha then I have to figure out another way of going about it. But this is why, if you did the nine classes, it gives us a buffer. Yeah. So it's like okay, like this wasn't expected, but it's fine because we have time to work on stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm only saying that I don't predict that it will because looking at her energy, like she seems to me like a stable dog. She's definitely an alert here. Yeah. Uh, she's also fairly overstimulated, which is not uncommon. Overstimulation. You see how she keeps standing up and yeah. you keep sitting her down that would be overstimulation. If I was here with my pit, my pit would be laying at my feet sleeping right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, because she's like, she's calming down. So, um, but yeah, um, if, you know, let's say we're pressing the boundary of like people trying to pet her and stuff, and she were to freak out, that would be another point of like, we have to stop the behavior before we can actually move past it. Okay. It's another point of it's like, if you're not willing to work past that and or replicate it, because it takes repetition, for the dog okay. to learn what, what they can and can't do, then we're not gonna get anywhere, okay? okay? Now, if you're doing everything as instructed, at least with the social aspect, remember, we cannot make her like people or kids yeah. or whatever. We have things that we can do, but if for whatever reason she's just like, you know what, I really just don't like kids or I don't like kids I don't know or what have you, yeah. then I go, unfortunately, that's just where she's at. But you will have control so that even though she doesn't like kids or whatever, you still have the ability to keep her under control so that nothing's gonna happen. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the behavioral aspect is I want your dog to be social, mm -hmm. as social as she can be. Um, the, the obedience aspect gives you control just in case it's like, you know what, you've done this a thousand times and she just does not like this person. Then I go, that's fine, but at least you have a means of controlling her so there's never gonna be a negative interaction there. Okay. Okay. And then you do most of your training here I know you For, mentioned the home. Yes. So okay. like the obedience stuff, we can knock out here. Okay. Okay. And it's great because we have distractions and yeah. everything. Okay. Uh, for like people coming over, obviously it has to be done in the home. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole socializing with people, technically we can do it uh, like at my facility, mm -hmm. but it, it'd probably be best because you're trying to build off of they entered my home yeah. and then also you're going to interact with them. Okay. okay. So that one typically is also done in the home. Uh, but any obedience related stuff we can do outside in the environment. Okay. Okay. Other questions? And then do you recommend my husband and daughter be there during the Whoever combat? would be um, handling her. Okay. So if your husband's like another like primary handler yeah. is what I would I say, then I would say yes. Okay. okay. Now does he have to be in all of them? No. Okay. Um, the first class is definitely very important because it's like a big chunk of information and the third class uh, where we're like bringing people over or any like kind of behavior class would also be like very helpful yeah. that he um, that he shows up to. Okay. okay. Otherwise, if both people come to the class, that would be ideal. Okay. And then um, if he doesn't make it, what's, uh, I record these now, so then I, I send you the link to your video oh, cool. so that okay. you're able to review them later. So if he misses one, he could just watch the training video okay. himself. Okay. Yeah. Um, other questions? When we do the socialization aspect, should I have like family or friends come over? Yeah, so we'll plan that stuff out. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we can either do it as I show you how, how to do the socialization myself coming yeah. into the home, or it's like, hey, let me invite my sister over yeah. so we can actually do it real time with a person that she would see over and over again. Okay. So then you're essentially just building off of what we covered in the actual yeah. class. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I think that's all I can think of right now. Um, when it comes to booking, you know, you can email Tina. Okay. Uh, if you want to expedite things a little bit, what you can do is say, hey, Tina, uh, sign me up for X amount of classes, and uh, here's my availability, or here's my husband's and I's availability. Okay. Because um, that's what she's going to do. She's going to cross-reference your calendar with my calendar to find okay. where do we have spots that line up. Okay. okay that makes sense. Uh, she'll send you a contract form. Uh, please note that we do go by the contract because it's first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. So the moment that contract is submitted, she knows you're serious. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, once, and it's, pay in full to get started right away. And then okay. you, she'll get you locked in into your time and everything like that. Okay. And then she'll send you the information for the e-collars as well. I don't care where you get your collar from. I do just care that you get one of the collars that I recommended for okay. you. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then 
what are your training hours usually like? Depends. Like okay. I don't really have a schedule just because um, I own the business. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I, so I do the boarding trains and the daycare okay. trains. So I used to have two other trainers, but they left. They went to go back to school. Yeah. So I absorbed all their clients. Oh my yeah, and, I, and then I'm taking over the board and trains and daycare and trains again. So I'm in the process of working with a couple more employees to yeah. do training as well. Um, typically right now, it's uh, Saturday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesdays. Okay. okay? And then, uh, so because since I have the other, uh, the board and trains and stuff like that, we're trying not to scatter me across too much because um, uh, since I'm located in the West Loop now or west of the West Loop, it's like 30 minutes to get here. So then if I come here for one client and then leave back, that's like two hours out the day. Oh, sure. So typically like Saturdays, I'm here, I'm like eight to 12, then I have a lunch and then I come back and then like one to five is like all back to back, okay? okay? But uh, when she looks at your schedule, if nothing lines up, she'll ask me and say like, do you want to put them on a different day? And then I just, I give them the thumbs okay. up or whatever, okay? Yeah. Um, other questions? That's it. Okay. Well, if there's anything you forgot to ask, you can ask Tina. Okay. If it pertains to me, she'll ask me and I'll send her an email to, to give okay. you the answer. Otherwise, uh, anything else that she'll, she'll answer herself. Oh, one more question. Um, she's scheduled to get spayed in August 7th. Okay. Um, which is only in a few weeks, I'm sure. I don't know if we'll even get started by then, but mm -hmm. will that change her behavior at no. all? Okay. The, uh, spaying or uh, and neutering will help address um, hormonal-based behaviors. Marking, the need to mate, okay. mounting. Um, I had very, very rare, and so I had a case, it was a deaf uh, bull terrier um, who was attacking the dog inside the home. And I told him, I'm like, I'm pretty sure your dog is frustrated because he needs to mate at least twice a year and you're not meeting that requirement because he was already like four to six years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was like, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not even a person that recommends spaying or neutering if you're doing it in response to behavioral stuff. But in that time, I told him, I was like, I think you should neuter your dog. Okay. And sure enough, all the, it all stopped. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Uh, if it was like, oh, she like pees in the spot in the house, like the same spot, then I would say that it would help that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so it helps hormonal based behaviors, but not really anything like that. Okay. Because okay? uh, being territorial is, is, is not related to it. Okay. To the hormone levels. I feel like, I don't know if it was just me or what, but I feel like she got worse after she had her heat cycle. Sure. So dogs have three uh, personality shifts, six months, a year, and two years. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Six months is teen, uh, terrible two's brain, teenager body. <laughs> okay. One year is teenager brain, adult body. Two years is adult dog. Okay. Okay. So that's why I was asking, like, when did these behaviors start? So if you would have said, oh, this started when she turned six months, it would make sense. Yeah. Right? So if this has always been since she was a puppy, then to me this seems like genetics. Okay. It, it's been around since you got her in two months. Yeah. Okay, it's nothing that either developed or it's nothing that was in response to. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say, like I've had clients whose dogs were attacked as a puppy mm -hmm. at six months or a year, and literally from one day to the next, they just shift, and now, now all of a sudden they're aggressive with dogs. Okay. And it's because they got attacked, a, a traumatic event happened right as there was a, a pivotal personality shift. And those things combined cause the dog to now become dog okay. aggressive. Okay. In your case, it sounds like it's it's she's always been this way, so I would just label it as genetics. Okay. Okay. Nothing that you did right or wrong. It's just she was just born that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Um, do you have any like information or handouts along the way when you do these things, or it's just it's just all explanation. All explanation. Working. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. I'll give you your homework, and then you have access to your videos and stuff as a okay. reference. If there's something that we cover that like you're having issues with, if I happen to have another case that I work with and have it on camera, mm -hmm. I send you the links to the okay. videos as a, as, a, as like a reference. Gotcha. Otherwise, um, if you want to learn more of how we train, like you have the, the training videos, there's a playlist called uh, Dog Training and Client Highlights. That playlist has examples of other cases that I've worked with where I use the footage, but then I explain what's going on. Okay. So it's not like an hour long video, it's like a 10 to 15 minute video yeah. meant to like break down the concepts and everything. Okay. okay. Just to kind of give you a bit of insight of how the e collar works. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah. We're not uh we're not fancy with the pamphlets or anything. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. Well if there's anything else you need, let us know. All right. Otherwise